morning we continue our study of spiritual gifts. Uh, we will have word of prayer, but be seated. If you don't have your spiritual gifts booklet, we still have some that we can get to you. So as we uh, sit down, raise your right hand. A couple of fellows after prayer run back and grab the few copies that we have left. We can pass. Doing the, we're not doing the word right. <laughs> we are coming to a, a, a right conclusion, but we're not going to the word right. We're going to do that in 1 Corinthians. And so we were talking about the fact that, that biblical tongues should agree with the biblical mandate for tongues, which would be that it should be coming from a person of uh, moral integrity, that it should be coming Different prophecy, but now I want to talk about the difference between tongues. Because if you look in the First Corinthians, First Corinthians uh, deals with tongues in an extensive manner, and so First Corinthians thirteen is what we're going to look at now. In your booklet, we're looking at the difference in Acts 2 tongues and 1 Corinthian tongues. That's where we are in your booklet if you want to take some notes. Now let's just go through a couple of things really quickly here this morning, and then we'll get into 1 Corinthians 13. There are folks that will say, hey, the 1 Corinthians tongues that, that was dealt with in the, first, in the church at Corinth by Paul, they'll talk about that being a different situation than Acts. The reason they do that is because Acts clearly delineates what tongues are, that tongues are known own languages by individuals. And what had happened in the book of Acts at this day of Pentecost, there were a number of Jewish believers, not Jewish believers as far as Christians yet, but a number of Jewish followers, of followers of Judaism, that lived all throughout different parts of the world. And they came to Jerusalem for the feast. And so they're there for the feast, and then on the day of Pentecost, in fulfillment of the book of Joel, a prophecy in the book of Joel, it's actually a prophecy of judgment. That God says, I'm going to speak to you, I'm going to, uh, uh, these tongues are going to happen, and, and many of you are still going to turn your heart away. Now, yes, there were 3,000 people 
that did come to know the Lord there on the day of Pentecost. But as a whole, the Jewish nation has rejected the Messiah. And that was what was prophesied in Joel, that the, these tongues would happen, that they would speak, there would be this wonderful manifestation, this fulfillment of prophecy, and yet the children of Israel would say, no, we're not going to follow this Messiah. And so that's what the Acts 2 situation was, where men came, they started speaking, these were unlearned men, these were not folks who had been to uh, all different kinds of places and learned all different kinds of dialects. It's probable that they knew a couple of dialects just because of their upbringing in the Jewish nation, as well as being in Rome there, in a, in a Roman prefect or whatever. And so they would have had the opportunity to know different languages, but not necessarily, because I think many of us are aware that just because there are many people in your country that speak a different language doesn't mean that we learn it. Is that right? Okay? Because there are many folks out there, you don't know any other language. You've heard the joke, right? What do you call uh, a person that speaks three languages? Trilingual, person that speaks two languages. Bilingual, person that speaks one language. American, yeah, that's what you call them. And so, and that, that's, that's pretty normal, that's the joke. So, in Acts 2, they spoke one language that they knew. People heard many different languages being spoken by the apostles and by the disciples there on the day of Pentecost, and folks were wondering what was going on. So. In going through and trying to delineate that they're different things, I just pointed out some things here. It's the same word in both passages. So to use the same word to describe different things, that's not really what your Bible does. It uses different words to describe different things. Um, tongue, the word actually means language in Greek. And so it's, it's a, a different kind of tongue is a different family of tongue. In other words, if I were to say, well, that's a different kind of fish, you still would understand that it was a fish. You would not say, oh, different kind of fish. I wonder if it's a mammal. I wonder if it's a bird. I wonder if it's an insect. You would know what family it is. And so the kind there in 1 Corinthians 12, when it's talking about different kinds of tongues, it's talking about different families, just like different nationalities or different languages that we would understand. It's the same purpose. It was miraculous. It's not learned. It's the same reaction that Paul gives. There's, if there's no interpreter, if there's nobody to understand the language, then you're not supposed to use it. And so this is the exact same thing in both places. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, Paul says, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Paul said, listen, the most important thing is prophesying. What is prophecy? Prophecy is not telling the future. Prophecy is what? Telling forward the word of God. So by someone standing up and teaching, um, if, you are, if you are teaching your children in Sunday school, if you're teaching your kid at home and you are teaching them God's word, you are prophesying. You are telling forth the word of God. Prophesying does not mean looking into the future and telling the future. Many times God would tell his prophet, go and tell them my word. And part of his word had to do with what would happen in the future if they didn't react correctly. And so we kind of link that with, okay, this is, this is future, but that's not what the Bible is talking about, okay? But we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13, because this is the passage that I had numerous people come in and say, okay, here's, here's what the Bible teaches about tongues. Why aren't, when are you going to teach this? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. Look down at verse 8. Many of you probably have this on your wall somewhere at home. Charity never fails. Love never fails. How many of you have a love never fails decoration somewhere in the house? Oh, some of you, and you're just not going to raise your hand. I've been in some of your houses. I've seen it. So love never fails. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, here is what the teaching has been. That, that people have come to me and said, that which is perfect, the perfect is the Bible, some folks actually referenced a certain rendition or translation of the Bible. They said, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Now, I'm, I'm wanting to teach here. I'm not wanting to pick fights. If your brother, dad, grandfather taught what I'm about to start addressing, I'm not attacking them personally. Do you know one of the wonderful things about being an independent Baptist is individual soul liberty? Do you know what that means? 
We've forgotten this as Baptists, but Baptists don't have to agree. We've kind of forgotten that in modern era. We're like, no, no, if you're going to be a Baptist, you have to think the same way as everybody else. No, you don't. You don't have to think the same way as everybody else. That's, that's, that's the joy of being a Baptist, in individual soul responsibility. Because as a Baptist, we believe in what as the final authority? God's Word. Well, who helps us interpret God's Word? Holy Spirit. Well, why are there different opinions about what God's Word says? Because everybody's not as spiritual as you. That's why. Okay? And when we all get to that point, we all will eventually agree, okay? I promise when we get to heaven, there will not still be differences of interpretations at that point in time. But I am not trying to pick. But I'm just going to point out a couple of things. First of all, there were a few folks that said, when that which is perfect has come. And so uh, when the King James Bible showed up, then that which was in part was done away with. Tongues disappeared long before 1611. Can't be talking about the King James Bible. Other folks say, well, when, it's talking about when the Bible was finished. So not necessarily the King James, but when the Bible was finished. So when the Apostle John finished penning Revelation, and he finished up with chapter 22, and, and he got done and said, don't anybody add to the words of this book, that means that it is now perfect, it is complete, and now tongues have ceased. And that's not necessarily a bad theory, but... That's not interpreting this passage correctly. So I want to, to help you see and understand what this, what this passage means. And this is one of the advantages, what we were talking about in another service, about having the ability to go and look. You do not have to have a degree to find this kind of stuff out. You just have to take the time and jump into God's Word. And it is a blast to do so. It is absolute. Listen, you will learn infinitely more when you do it than if I yap and you listen. And so I would encourage you to do this. Now let's look. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13. Charity does not fail. Charity never fails. So there will never be a time when love is not in operation. Will love be in operation in heaven? Absolutely. There's going to be love in heaven. Love will, will never... See, Paul is talking about this importance of understanding the, the primacy of love. And that, because the, unit, the disunity, the factions in the church were a problem, so Paul's trying to address this. So he says, love doesn't fail. Now, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, there are different words in the original. There are different words in the Greek. When you look at it, it says, okay, prophecies, tongues, and knowledge, they're all, all the same thing. It's not the same thing. And let me explain it to you. If you look at the word fail, okay, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And look at the words after knowledge, it shall vanish away. The same word in both of those places. But when Paul wrote about tongues ceasing, it's a different word and it's a different tense. Now let me explain it to you, okay? The word for fail and vanish away is a Greek word, which I have no idea how they uh, Anglicanize. It would be katargeo, okay? The actual tense of this, I think, is katarsethomenai. You don't care. I don't know why I even tried to say it, okay? But what katargeo means is it means that it is rendered inoperative. It is rendered inoperative. In other words, it is no longer occurring. So it's not the idea, when we see the word fail, we think it somehow did something bad or is no longer able to accomplish its goal. But it's not that, that prophecy, that speaking forward the word of God is going to no longer accomplish anything because we know the word of the Lord endures how long? Forever. So do you think we're just going to have God's word in heaven, but we're not going to be talking about it? Well, but the current method of prophecy, of preaching the word of God, that is going to become inoperative. It is going to be rendered inactive. Now, here's the thing. This is a passive voiced verb. What does a passive voiced verb mean? Something acts on it. 
So when Paul says, and this is, and some of you are saying, all right, Pastor Gilbert, I don't like all of this Greek mathematician stuff. You're trying to make us think like we can't understand. No, you can. You can get it. You can absolutely get it from the English. I don't want you to think that you can't get it from the English. But remember, you are getting it in black and white. We're going into HD here. You're going to notice some stuff that you didn't see before. Okay? And, and many of you in here, you remember what it was like to watch the black and white televisions. And you still got the picture, but it's a lot different nowadays with HD, 4K, and whatever else. So all of that to say this, the prophecy and the knowledge, okay, something is going to act on it that is going to render it inoperative. But when you get to that word for tongues, it's a completely different word. Um, let me give you an example, Galatians 5, 4, okay? Here's another example of this. We're studying the book of Galatians. Here's another example. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 4, Christ is katargeo. Christ is rendered ineffective, rendered inoperative whenever we try to justify ourselves by the law. Does that mean that God no longer has power? Does that mean that God is destroyed? No, that means when we try to apply law, we render Christ katargeo. He's rendered inoperative. Are you with me? So he is no longer at work. We have stepped away from grace. We have stepped away from the spirit. And we've tried. We've nullified him. We've gone to the law. That's, that's the exact same word there. But there's a different word. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. This is a completely different word that means, anybody want to guess? Cease. Pretty good, huh? But here's the difference. This is a middle voice. It's an intransitive verb. Okay? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an object. It's like the wind died down. Did the wind kill down? How do you die down? That's an intransitive verb. Now we're getting into English and some of you are like, I did not come to church for English. And you're getting upset and I understand. I'm not going to stay here long. But what this means is knowledge and prophecy. Something is going to happen that is going to cause it to be inoperative. Tongues is going to stop itself. It's going to render itself inoperative. It by itself is going to cease. Um, here, here's another use of this word, maybe to help you understand, okay? Acts 20, verse 1. This is uh, when there was an uproar there at Ephesus, and they had started a big riot. The Bible says in Acts 21, and after the uproar was ceased. And this means that the, the energy, the riot, everything that had happened there in Acts, it died down. How did it die down? It acted upon itself. It didn't, they didn't send soldiers out there and died. When, when the energy was gone, when it had dissipated, so the uproar, it, it died on its own. It ceased. So you have two different things happening in 1 Corinthians 13, all right? So go back to 1 Corinthians 13. You have prophecy and knowledge that something is going to act upon, and you have tongues that is going to stop itself. You say, Pastor, why does this matter? Well, again, you have to get to the right reason with the right things. Okay, so whatever it is that's perfect that comes has nothing to do with tongues. Are you with me? One person is. The rest of you are still looking up here. I, I'm not trying to, I, I don't want to go too fast. I don't want to, I, I'm getting a, lot of, getting a lot of feedback about reviewing, and I'm nervous about reviewing. But do you understand how tongues is different from knowledge and prophecy? Tongues is going to stop itself. It's going to die down, all right? Now, if you want to, well, what's the perfect thing? Well, that's something that can be debated because when that which is perfect has come. Some folks have said, okay, when that which is perfect, well, then some folks have said, that's the Bible. Uh, when, when that which is perfect is come, uh, then, that which is, then that's when knowledge and prophecies will cease. Here's my problem with that. Has prophecy stopped as an operation, a major operation of God's kingdom? As a prophet, I would hardly say no. We preach all of the time, okay? Has, now, knowledge deals uh, in the same area as the, the gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation. Has, has knowledge ceased? No, so I, I don't know that it's the Bible that, that could be. Some folks will say, well, it's the church, okay? What's the first argument against it being the church? 
So I ain't perfect. Church is not complete. The church is ever growing. It never, whether you take perfect as meaning completely fulfilled or you take perfect as meaning perfect, either one doesn't fit as, as far as the church. So some folks would say, well, well then it, it was the mature church. And so there's a lot of debate there, but I want you to understand all of that debate has no impact on whether or not if tongues should be operating because tongues are going to cease for themselves. Now, so when did tongues cease? Um, some of you are probably going to wonder, what do I think the perfect is? I, I think the perfect is the eternal state. I, I think that's when, the, the, I don't believe we're going to have preaching sessions in heaven like we're having now. I don't think we're going to have discipleship in heaven like we're having now. We're going to be taught freely by the Holy Spirit. We will be learning, but it won't be the same operations. Okay? But tongues will have ceased. Well, when have tongues ceased? Okay, go to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to look at something. Hebrews 2. And then, even though some of you don't necessarily enjoy it, we're going to look at a little bit of church history just to support what we're talking about here in Hebrews chapter 2. The reason that I believe that tongues is one of the manifestation gifts is because God tells us that he's going to give those that follow him power, that he is going to give those manifestation gifts, and we see those manifestation gifts manifesting themselves in the book of Acts. Paul sees some of those gifts. Peter sees some of those gifts. There are actually cases in the book of Acts where there is a believer who was alive and believed in the coming of the Messiah and followed John the Baptist, even was baptized by John the Baptist. He had rejected the Judaism system of trying to earn your, your salvation by works. And there were people walking around like that that ran into believers who understood the truth of the gospel. And they said, have you received the Holy Spirit? We answer that question completely differently today because the Holy Spirit was actually manifesting himself in different areas to accomplish what Jesus Christ had sent him to do. And one of the manifestation gifts was speaking in tongues. And in that particular instance in Acts, they taught them about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came down and filled them and immediately gave them the manifestation sign of being able to speak in a tongue, in a language they did not know and had not studied previously. When we get to the book of Hebrews, okay, when we get to the book of Hebrews, we see that there is an argument made that the timing is very important for what we're studying as far as tongues. Hebrews 2 verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says, how shall we escape, 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 if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. What does one's confirmed mean? It's happened. It was confirmed. How was it confirmed? Hmm, look at verse 4. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. So Paul is saying we cannot ignore this truth that has been delivered to us and has been confirmed with all of these manifestation gifts, all these wonderful gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the other the final and last argument, and then we'll get into the book of prophecy unless you have some questions. The final and last argument and why I do not believe that manifestation gifts like gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, gifts of tongues, different things like that. They have redefined them. There's now gifts that aren't even in the Bible. God will fill your mouth with gold and, you know, the, the name it, claim it type of prosperity gospel. But one of the things that's very important to understand is that when you study the Bible, okay, how many times were miracles a routine and normal part of the followers of God, how many times were they a normal part of their existence? If you think through it, okay? Now, I don't mean to upset somebody. I know some of you have been healed from cancer. You have been, and I'm not saying that God doesn't work miracles, but I'm saying as a normal routine part of the followers of God experience, okay? God has been answering prayer as long as we've been praying, okay? So I'm not talking about answers to prayer. I'm talking about human beings being able to enact miracles. When was the first time that a couple of people, it seems like they were given some pretty cool powers? Moses, right? 
Moses and the, the rod and it split the Red Sea and brought water from the rock and all of the different things. So you have the time of Moses and Joshua and you look at those, that time frame, that was honestly probably one of the longer time frames that miracles were in existence because you had the entire time frame of the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, nothing wearing off their feet, uh, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. Uh, you have the miracles continuing as Joshua went into the, uh, the promised land, right? The blowing of the trumpets brought down uh, the, the walls of Jericho. Jericho. Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. Yes, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. We see those different things happen. When's the next time that you see miracles as a routine experience for the followers of God? It's Elijah and Elisha. Floating axe heads, okay, um, seeing the armies of God, uh, telling your boss what the enemy is doing as they're planning in their, in their, in their chamber, and, and all of those things. That was another time. The, the last time was during Jesus and the apostles, okay? During Jesus and the apostles, there is, miracles was never, ever in the Bible a routine part of the followers of God, of their existence. And if you were to look at church history, okay, the only mention of any type of strange ecstasy tongues speaking in the first five centuries is the heretic Montanus. That's the only one. In fact, it was so, so not part of the thinking that by the third and fourth centuries, they, they didn't, there was even a lot of different folks that wrote, different church fathers, that when they wrote, they themselves were saying, not really sure what this tongues is that Paul's talking about. It was so far removed from the church's experience. And so there's, the tongues ceased because God's, Salvation, his way of salvation, the coming of the Holy Spirit had been manifested to those believers who lived on both sides of the cross. And so I can't tell you an exact time, but I believe the last time that a person who was a believer before the cross understood the manifestation gifts of the Spirit uh, after the cross, that was, when the, that was when tongues acted on themselves and they ceased. Okay? Now, any questions? It's 10 o'clock. We can get into the uh, next study. Unless we have questions. Any, any questions about being a cessationist instead of a continuationist? Group this size. I don't anticipate. I've got my phone in case you don't want to raise your hand if you want to text something. Of course, then I tell you not to. Yes, I see the hand. Well, I believe what, what Paul, we don't know specifically, but what Paul is saying is he has just given them rules for their church service. And you have to understand in the church at Corinth, the church at Corinth, part of the Corinthian pagan worship was that ecstasy, where the only thing that's close to it that we understand is, is, is some of the tribal folks that will work themselves into a frenzy, their eyes will back in their head, and they'll begin speaking in an unknown language. Well, that was part of the Corinthian worship experience, and the Corinthians were trying to one-up each other in their worship services. So Paul gave them rules, said, women need to keep silent in the church. If, you're gonna, if somebody's going to speak in tongues, one or two by course, and always have an interpreter. If there's no interpreter, don't do it. And so he gave basic rules. And so there at 14, he's kind of wrapping it up saying, I'm not forbidding it, because this was still during the manifestation time. When, when God was validating the, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. So he's not forbidding it. He's saying it, it needs to be done correctly, and here's the correct way to do it. I don't know if there was somebody that was actually trying to say it was wrong at that time. I, I've, never, I've never studied it out to see. I don't know that Judaism would have, you know, the Judaizers would have been going after that. So the last miracle recorded in the book of Acts would have happened after Corinthians was written. So I, I believe it's Acts 28. Uh, so that, that's the last miracle that you have. In fact, that's really the last miracle in the New Testament. There is, uh, do you remember the last miracle? That was when Paul shook off the venomous beast from his hand, uh, fulfilling another thing from uh, Mark 16. So did that answer your question today or did I dance around it? Okay. 
Yes. I'm, the Bible does not delineate specifically when the tongues will cease. It does say that tongues will act on themselves. They will cancel themselves out. That's, that's what that word means. So it could, I can see somebody making the argument that it would have been perhaps happening during the life of the apostles. But I actually personally, and this is getting kind of into the weeds, but I think tongues actually probably stopped before the destruction of the temple because the temple seems to fulfill some of the Old Testament prophecies in Joel that they were going to reject and that God was going to finally uh, take away some of the things and, and prove to them their rejection. So I think tongues was actually gone well before John penned Revelation. So that, that's, but we're into interpretation there. Uh, we're, we're into interpretation, Brother Taylor, so it's not, the Bible doesn't specifically say. So, but it, it I would say it definitely would, would not have lasted past the last person who was alive on both sides. So that would, be an ex that would be an argument for until the last apostle, Apostle John, passed away because he was alive on both sides of the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit before the cross and after the cross. Okay, we have a, a, a question coming in by text. Were tongues a sign of judgment to unbelieving Jews? That is what I referenced earlier from Joel. So the unbelieving Jews that God told them that he was going to send them a sign and we understood as Peter said in Acts chapter 2 that this is what was talking about. That was part of what Peter was saying. He was trying to warn the Jews, this is, we've been waiting for this, this is the time, don't miss that. So tongues actually were a sign, partially a sign to unbelieving Jews, but they were also manifestation gifts because of what Jesus said in Mark 16. Okay, so they were assigned them both. All right, any other questions? Well, this is exciting. Yes, sir? The application today is being able to understand what God's word says and be able to explain it to somebody. I think it is very important to be able to, I, I'm not saying that we go attack people who believe in speaking in tongues and argue with them, but I, I believe we need to be able to pull out God's word and say, here's why, and not just, well, you'll do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. Let's not, let's not fuss about, it, it's not for the purpose of fussing, it's for the purpose of being able to explain, here is why the tongues have ceased. Because personally, I think that when you explain God's word, it doesn't return void. So I think that the better we are at explaining and tying what we believe to God's word instead of just, you do what you want, I'll do what I want. That's why I wouldn't argue with over the end, when tongues did cease, whether it was ap apostolic when, it, when the last apostle died or when it, if it was before the destruction of the temple. But we can use the Bible to, to clearly delineate that tongues did cease. And so I, I think that is, that is something that would actually be a help. And as a Christian brother, in love, I'm going to want to have people draw closer to the truth of God's word any chance I get. But this gets into spiritual gifts because Mr. Gorski asked the question. I put that on online so everybody knows who asked the question. He asked the question, what's the point of arguing? They're going to do what they want to do, okay? There's probably a little bit of an indicator that maybe Mr. Gorski and I don't have the exact same spiritual gift. And so he's looking at something saying, hey, this seems to be more important because what motivates him and what motivates me is different. So what motivates Brother Gorski to ask the question could be an indication of that spiritual gift. Because if you are a prophet or a teacher, you're going to be more truth-oriented. If you are a mercy or an exhorter, you're not going to be as much, you're going to be more interested in reaching. And so that, that kind of is an illustration why sometimes... Now, because Brother Gorski and I love each other, we're not going to fight over this. He's not going to leave the church because, you know, I'm, I'm attacking charismatics. I'm not going to remove him from the church because 
he's a mealy-mouthed individual who doesn't have any doctrine in his life. Okay? We're, we're not going to attack it. So that's, but the thing is, is that sometimes that's where the problems in churches will exist is because people that have two different motivations will argue over what has to be done instead of letting the Holy Spirit let that person do what they're supposed to do and let the other person do what they're supposed to do. Wonderful. Any other questions? We've got one more minute for questions. All right. We won't get into prophecy today. We'll get into prophecy next week. Thanks for coming. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed to come in here for church. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us, and thank you for your word that can direct and teach and guide and instruct. Lord, thank you for the opportunity today that we have to celebrate, Lord, the gift of your Son, and to look forward to that day when we will all agree standing before the throne. Lord, we thank you for the, the privilege of, of being able to worship. We love you. In Christ's name, amen, amen. We'll see you in a little bit.